It's amazing. It's frightening. It's Nathan Murphy. Good morning. How are you getting on? Happy New Year. I'm all right. Happy New, Happy New Year to you. We're still on that. Let's not go all Kenny Cunningham on it again. No, we're, we're all for it. A lot of interesting stuff happening. It's deal or no deal, in case people uh, haven't picked up on that uh, at uh, 20 past nine on this uh, Friday morning. And lots of interesting stuff, some of which we've been discussing already. But particularly, we're going to kick things off, uh, Nathan, with something close to home for yourself. Conflicting reports uh, during the week about Mo Salah and whether or not he's on Real Madrid's summer shopping list. He's contracted up to 2023. Not that that means anything. So the question here is if uh, Madrid or another super club come in with a big money offer this summer and with everything else that's going on at Liverpool, would it be a smart time to ship him on or is he too important to consider selling? He's too important to consider selling. I know he's going to be 29 by the end of the season, but we're talking about the Premier League's top scorer once again this season. He's a player who, anytime he has any sort of a barren spell, gets a huge amount of criticism, but he is still Liverpool's most technically gifted footballer. He is the one who has that bit of magic, who out of nothing creates goals, scores important goals, scores late goals. Generally, when they've needed them, he has always stepped up. And you can understand why there would be speculation. He's somebody who's very quiet, who anything you hear about off the pitch is a very good guy, who's kept his head down. This hasn't been a constant stream of rumours over the last three, four years, which generally is what happens when you have somebody of the talent of Mo Salah, when you go back to him scoring 32 Premier League goals in a season, straight away you would have expected really strong links to Real Madrid. But I, I would be shocked if Liverpool got rid. You, it's incredibly difficult to replace a player of the quality. Have they not? Have they There's, not already? Have they not already replaced him? Is that not? Is that not another big reason for getting him out of there? With who? Jota. Jota. Yeah. Jota's done well, and he's made as good an impact as you could have expected, but. Mo Salah's goal-scoring return is as good as we've seen from a Liverpool player in recent years. So Mo Salah's one of the best footballers in the world, in the top 10, if not in the top five best footballers in the world. Diogo Jota is not quite there yet. And I still think if you were looking at any of the three to sell, that Salah would be the last one I would sell. And I understand the constant talk about Firmino, of well, he's the first name on the team sheet. Firmino hasn't been at his best for the last year. Sadio Mane hasn't been at his best so far this season. Yet both of them escape the sort of criticism Salah does when he just goes a few games without scoring. So I would be incredibly reluctant if I was Jurgen Klopp to sell Salah. You've got to remember that he hasn't hit the 32 goals. One of the reasons he hasn't got to that level is that like, teams are all over him now. He creates the space for other players because they're so wary of the damage that Mo Salah could do. And I'm also not convinced by the Real Madrid link either. You'd have to imagine they've been a little bit burnt by the signing of Eden Hazard at his age. There's no sell-on value for Salah if he goes to Real Madrid. Mm -hmm. And all the speculation out of Spain is that they're looking at something younger. So whether it's Erling Haaland or the never-ending links with Kylian Mbappe, Salah will be a very different signing. And we know that Liverpool don't let anybody go cheap. Like if you're getting 15, 20 million quid for Dominic Solanke, what are you looking at for Mo Salah? Yeah, and uh, maybe one of the other reasons that he's not scoring as much or they're not scoring as much as they might is that obviously Fabinho and Henderson have been called elsewhere and that might be a contributing factor, which leads us on to the question about what Liverpool are going to do with the centre-back in the window. Like Klopp obviously saying this week, oh, it's a tricky situation. Um, he, you know, saying January is also a, is always a difficult window to do business in. This kind of guff that might really just be gaming the opposition or it might be gaming potential sellers. Like surely... They need. Surely, there's no question about this, Nathan. That they need to bring somebody in. It doesn't necessarily have to be somebody that they're planning to uh, have to guarantee game time to in the long term. But there must be a thirty-something centre back somewhere that they can bring in. That they have to. That they must bring in. Uh, surely, they can't survive without a new centre back. Uh, I'd agree and disagree. I think they do need to bring a centre-back in. I said this earlier in the week that you do not want to be finishing this season missing out on the title by a couple of points because of errors at the back when you could have gone and spent the money. I don't think they need to go and sign a 30-year-old. Klopp needs the right type of centre-half. And you're talking about Salah. One of the reasons they're not creating as much is because the defence is set up differently, that they can't play everything in Liverpool links together. So you can't have a 30-year-old who doesn't have a lot of pace, who can't play this ridiculously high line up on the halfway line who doesn't have the pace to get back. They just can't do that. But I do think looking at Joe Gomez 
injury history, looking at the fact that Virgil van Dijk isn't exactly 24, 25 when he does return, that you could go and spend whatever money you're planning on spending in a year, 18 months' time right now on that centre half who can be first choice for three or four years. Why not go and bring that forward? But I do think they have to do something. If they don't, I would expect they'll stick with that rotation of Phillips will get a game here, Williams will get a game, when Matty, whenever he's fit, but even a fully fit Joel Matty, everything we've seen suggests he can only play one game a week, and Liverpool are going to have two games a week every week between now and the end of the season. We'll see Jordan Henderson slotting in there as well, which maybe isn't as big an issue now that Thiago is back. But I think if you have the opportunity to go, and if you can somehow get that target, go and buy them. He's right, January is more difficult because if you are at a club of Liverpool's calibre, you're looking at other clubs of that calibre to spend a lot of money on, and clubs don't want to sell, particularly now when there are so many games where there's little time to get a replacement. So it, it is a juggling act. I wouldn't believe a huge amount of what he says because Liverpool get their business done quietly and behind the scenes. But if you're looking at a 30-year-old or a more mature defender, like are you looking at somebody like Connor Cody at Wolves, who obviously they have a decent relationship with, that you go in there and like, Cody started his career at Liverpool, you go in and maybe Wolves are looking at his contract and you're thinking 30, 35 million gets you that. That'd be a desperate gets you through move for the next him, two or three years. For him? Yeah. In that when everybody's fit again, Arguably he's not the best team in him. Europe. I don't think going to Liverpool is a desperate move for any player. To, I think it's a dream move play. for any player. Ultimately, he's not going to play. But I think he will. I think he will. I think this is, if they go and they sign... So Liverpool's first choice... Ideally, I'm sure from Jurgen Klopp's point of view, for the next three years would be Joe Gomez, Virgil van Dijk, week in, week out. But there's no guarantees that either of them are going to be fit. We don't know what van Dijk is going to come back like, whether there's going to be a niggly injury there as he starts to return. And Joe Gomez has had consistent injury problems. So there's going to be an opportunity for somebody to play a lot of games. Would you prefer to be the main man, the captain, the leader at Wolves and get yourself into the England squad and possibly starting for England during the summer? as Connor Cody would. I'm sure I'm sure that is something he's very focused on. But there's no reason all that can't happen right now. There's never been a better time for a centre-half to go to Liverpool. Like you could go right now for six months and end up winning the league in the Champions League. Did you just say you've gone to the best team in Europe? I think Liverpool are in the top two. Oh, he's... The reverse lights there on. That's, that's, that's no, no, what we're I, hearing. You don't think Liverpool are in that... Well, I mean, I just think you rushed in in your fit of peak to defend Liverpool's potential bid for Conor Cody. You rushed in with a fairly outlandish kind of a claim. Uh, there's nothing outlandish. Uh, but that said that the best outlandish team in Europe. That will be said. Well, factually incorrect, but well, Bayern Munich were the best team in Europe six months ago. These things change quite quickly. But Liverpool are the Premier League champions, so the two best teams in Europe right now are Bayern Munich. And Liverpool. So to say that there's no reason to suggest Liverpool aren't the best team in Europe, that they wouldn't go and beat Bayern Munich if they meet in the Champions League this season. But that is the level Liverpool are at. So if you're Conor Cody, as well as your links to the place, I think the opportunity to go to Liverpool, if it comes along, you're taking it every day of the week. Mm. Um, speaking of some of one of the best teams in Europe, uh, Manchester United, Nathan, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer have bought uh, one of the most exciting young prospects in the game. Um, they've completed the signing of Atalanta teenager Ahmad Diallo. 18-year-old comes in for an initial fee of 21 million quid. Uh, there'll be add-ons as well, and uh, roughly sort of double that. What it gives a 30-second roundup of what we know about Ahmad Diallo? Uh, that he's very young, has a huge amount of talent, but has played very little first-team football. So last season he got some game time, and it was almost a year before he started to get game time in the league again. For Atalanta. Part of that seems because Manchester United were in and maybe they didn't feel the need to have him playing every match because they knew he was going to leave the club. So it's a lot of money for a lot of unproven talent. It comes with a big reputation, but at 18, I know they're saying they're going to put him into the first team squad. It is that long term planning of, well, if he can play out on the right hand side, if you're going to move Mason Greenwood eventually into the middle, does he become part of a front three alongside Rashford or Greenwood? You know, could he play possibly a little bit deeper at times? So everything I've read, I've, I've only seen him for 20 minutes against Midtjylland. I was doing the commentary on Atalanta against Midtjylland. And he looked good. He didn't look like an 18-year-old. He didn't look out of his depth in any way. But considering the lack of game time for somebody of the quality of Danny van der Beek so far this season, it's hard to see how Diallo is going to be thrown in and playing week in, week out. But at 18, Manchester United are taking a punt, obviously, but they feel 
and they would trust your scouting system that it's a it's a worthwhile punt. Yeah, he'll probably come in and sit in the bench for a while, as uh, as Donny has done, and there's been some chat about that obviously this week. Uh, Dimitar Barbatov saying that he should be banging on Ole's door, which I'm sure he probably is. He says I wouldn't be surprised if he's starting to look for the exit, and nobody will blame him. Something isn't working, and United for their part are saying that they brought him into the club with future seasons in mind, and there's a lot of clamour to get him in the team. Um, the future seasons in mind thing seems slightly bizarre in that like they struggled at times this season in a way that uh, he might have been able to fix some of those issues. So what happens here, Nathan? Does he uh, himself clamour for the exit door or is he going to stay patient? And what is, what's in, look into your, gaze into your ball there, your crystal ball and tell us what's in the future of Donny van der Beek. Well, the instant future, I guess, is he's looking at the Euros coming up and he wants to be in that Dutch team. And if he's not playing any football, it's going to be very difficult for him to force his way into that. Uh, he started one Premier League game. He's not a kid. He's not this 18-year-old coming in. He was a key player for Ajax two years ago. He's also versatile in that he can play in that. More def- one of the exciting parts for Manchester United was you felt, well, you know, he could play in that defensive role. He could play instead of Bruno Fernandes if they needed to rest him. He could play out in the right-hand side instead of Mason Greenwood. We haven't seen him in any of these places at all. So mm-hmm. one Premier League start... Clearly something is going on, whether he was thrust upon Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, that a deal was done in the background and Solskjaer wasn't quite sure. In fairness to Solskjaer, if he doesn't see a spot from him, who are you dropping? Who are you leaving out of that Manchester United team right now? If he doesn't trust them, say, as a defensive midfield, and I've heard Damien Delaney talking about how, because United's back four, he feels, are quite weak, that they need that double protection of Fred and Scott McTominay. I'm sure Solskjaer would prefer to have a player in there. He doesn't need two defensive midfielders to protect his defence. And maybe that's where somebody like a Donny van der Beek could come in and get a little bit more game time. But he's not going to get it in that advanced role that Bruno Fernandes is playing because Fernandes is simply undroppable. And it may just be one of those unfortunate cases. Yeah, it's a lot of money. But again, I suppose we're looking at the wealth of Manchester United and compared to everyone else that they can go and spend 20 million, possibly raising to 40 million on an 18-year-old kid who may not feature for a year, 18 months, that United can write off 40 million. And Van de Beek shouldn't have lost a huge amount of value if he were to go during the summer. But he has become that sort of cause celeb for Manchester United supporters. That whenever they're losing, it's where is he? And how can he show his mm-hmm. best stuff when you're getting five, ten minutes off the bench? No, it's very week? difficult. Yeah, very difficult. I've seen you at times, Nathan, be accused of uh, being a Manchester United supporter during your commentary. So one more on that, um, because it looks like Steve Bruce has been linked with a bunch of um Manchester United reserves, Phil Jones among them, who's the biggest surprise for me is that it, uh, he's 28, it says here in my script. Are these a bunch of players that, uh, there's him, Jesse Lingard is in there, uh, Brandon Williams, um, that will, th- this will be the most important thing for to help Newcastle's survival or their future, or would they have any impact at all? Uh, you'd have to think they've all got quality that would improve Newcastle as left back they're playing Matt Ritchie at the moment Brandon Williams when he's played for Manchester United it's a surprise that they would let him go I'd expect it might be a loan deal for Williams I know he's been linked with a move to Germany as well and that they have Tellez and they have Shaw there at the moment but I think for a young player keep that option open of bringing him back if he goes and if he was to flourish for half a season at Newcastle Jesse Lingard's played little or no football over the last couple of years he's on the bench getting a few minutes, barely even a few minutes here and there, for him to come in now mid-season and make an impact. But Newcastle don't have a, don't really have a solid team behind Callum Wilson, Joe Linton. They seem to do a lot of rotation in midfield. Hendrick is in and out, so I'm sure Lingard would get plenty of game time. And McPhil Jones we haven't seen either. They've got a lot of centre-backs, Newcastle. From an Irish point of view, I wouldn't particularly be too keen to see him there. I want to see Kieran Clark continue in the heart of that Newcastle defence. He looked really strong since he's come back from injury. He's somebody that you would be surprised if he stays fully fit. Would be starting alongside John Egan for Ireland, uh, maybe ahead of Shane Duffy even come March. So these are how these transfers work. Steve Bruce has the connections at United. The only thing is, you'd imagine, particularly Lingard and Jones are on a huge wage bill. And while they may come at a reduced price, and Lingard they activated his contract extension to keep some sort of value there. Like, is Mike Ashley going to sanction a move on? wages well into six figures a week jesse lingard is the most newcastle player of all time so we'll uh, that's that's an inevitability that that move will happen at some point one give me 30 seconds now an actual 30 seconds this time uh on just to wrap up mark travers completed a move to league one swindon obviously failed to make the breakthrough at bournemouth smart move for him 21 yeah 
Uh, 21 is the key. He's a goalkeeper at 21. Still incredibly young. The remarkable thing for Travers is that he got in so early for Bournemouth and made those few appearances in the Premier League. But there's no shame in not making it for him at this season. Asmir Begovic is their goalkeeper, 33, you know, been at Chelsea, Bosnian keeper, 80 internationals. So if Begovic stayed and Begovic was fit and interested, he was probably always going to be the number one for Bournemouth. Travers obviously feels he needs to go and get some game time quickly. And it's a good thing for Ireland again, where we don't have goalkeepers playing that coming into March, if he has a run of games out, albeit in League One. Well, it's better than him sitting on the bench at Bournemouth. But I think Mark Travers still has a long way to go in this game. Yeah. All right. Come on. Uh, I, I was going to tell you, enjoy the football tonight, but I mean, I don't know if that's actually going to happen. But uh, any, I presume it's still in the same holding pattern. Well, Villa reserves. Villa under 23s. Yeah. Might Versus be what we under 23s. We'll see. Come on, yeah. Nathan. Thanks. The that's excitement for to the cup. For, for today. I signed for them after the Euros, and after my first day's training on a driving home, I was actually thinking, regretting it, what have I done? Like, I walked into a circus. It's amazing, isn't it?